Today, I'm going to cover a little bit different topic for LeoStream and talk about LeoStream in the context of DevOps. And really, when I talk about DevOps, there's two ways that LeoStream fits into this. One, of course, if you are adopting DevOps practices, then your LeoStream environment fits right into that. We do have a number of customers who are treating the LeoStream platform as part of their infrastructure as code. And so they are automating, rebuilding, and tearing down all of LeoStream, the brokers and the gateways, as part of their infrastructure as, as code environment. I've seen people doing this with Ansible. I know our support team is putting together some FAQs on how to do that. So if you have questions, you can always reach out to them. I've also seen people doing this up in AWS using Terraforms. There's a number of different ways that you can do this. Basically, pick your favorite, and it'll work out great. Again, you can always contact us if you have questions. I'm not going to run through an example right here. So that's the first part. LeoStream fits into your DevOps practices just in general. And then once you have LeoStream deployed, well, then it's a matter of the platform can help you manage the environment in ways that are, are very similar to other DevOps concepts that you're used to. LeoStream has tools to automate capacity. We don't build the virtual network works for you, but we can provision virtual machines into appropriate networks based on the rules that you specify, for example. The other practice that LeoStream supports supports very well is collaboration. So when you're connecting users into your environment for teams that are scattered across the country or maybe just in different buildings on, in your campus, you can support collaboration through LeoStream by allowing them to send invitations and then work on the same session together. Something else that's big in DevOps, I meant Linux. Who doesn't love Linux? Especially if you're talking about managing environments for developers, they tend to really love working on Linux. And Linux management has always been a strong point for Linux or for LeoStream. We can handle any Linux distribution and we support a number of different display protocols for connecting users to Linux. And I have even seen a customer managing Linux containers and connections to Linux containers from LeoStream and that worked great for them. The final thing I'll, I'll point out, which is very common when you're talking about kind of adopting DevOps into your organization, is using the cloud. And LeoStream supports all three major cloud players, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, as well as OpenStack. So if you just want to build an internal private cloud based on some open source software, you can leverage OpenStack and use LeoStream to manage that environment. You get all the automated capacity controls and power controls that you have for any kind of public cloud, cloud environment. So to show you how some of this works in LeoStream, let me go over to my screen. There we go. So as I mentioned, I'm not going to show you doing the automated deployment of LeoStream itself. You can always reach out to us for questions on that. What I am going to show you is some of these other management capabilities that you have in LeoStream. To do that, let me log into the LeoStream web interface. I'm going to log in as the main admin. And users can use this exact same interface to connect to their desktops as well. I'll show you that here in a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in. Now I'm not going to step through a full demo here. Let me just point out some of the features that are, are interesting when you're talking about implementing these DevOps workflows. First of all is, as I mentioned, you can hook up to any public cloud environment that you have. I happen to have two of them set up here, AWS and Azure. A center in LeoStream, it's any third-party hosting system that we use their APIs to interact with. And once we interact with their APIs, that gives you the good integration to do provisioning. We can launch instances, we can terminate them, we can power control them. This gives you the ability to scale out and then scale back in as needed. So that's the centers for the cloud integration. The other thing I want to point out is authentication. It's very important that once you have these environments that you authenticate users and then only allow, obviously, authenticated users to have access to it. And what I'm actually going to show you as part of this demo when we look at the end user experience is logging in with Okta in my case. But basically, I'm going to use our corporate identity provider and use the SAML protocol to have the IDP, Okta, 
after it authenticates me, redirect me into Leo stream. This is great in for zero trust environments, particularly if you have resources that are up in the cloud, you want to make sure that you're really locking down access to those, keep them in a private network, use your SAML based IDP for, for access into Leo stream, and then you're not even passing any passwords around. So that's why I have my SAML based authentication server here. So if we look in configuration here, let's talk a little bit about pools. Pools in LeoStream, ultimately users will get assigned to machines. And, and as I mentioned this in this one customer's use case, containers, users will get offered out to these based on the pools you give them permission to access. But pools also control provisioning. So it's inside the pools that you have this automated capacity control. As an example here, here I'm spinning up a, a pool based on some high performance compute machines that I happen to have hosted up in AWS. The way the pools work in LeoStream, there's a definitions area here where you'll say what is in this pool and it's very dynamic. So as you create new machines, either within LeoStream or even just by going to the management consoles for these environments themselves, when we scan the center that you've created for those environments, we'll pick up the new machines, change power states, remove anything else so that you constantly have a mirror of the states inside of LeoStream. So the pool definition defines the pool and then down here near the bottom is where I have enabled provisioning. And there's a couple ways that you can do this that are kind of relevant for these DevOps work workflows. One, you might wanna just have some static limits. You know, when you're going to rebuild your environment, you can delete all of your virtual machines. And then after you rebuild your LeoStream connection broker and hook it up to your database, it will see your pools are set to have, in this example, 10 machines in them. And so it would kick off the automatic provisioning of these 10 machines. So that's one way you can do it, just by setting static limits and refreshing when you're going through a rebuild of your infrastructure. Another way that you can provision is based on time of day. So maybe you rebuild your LeoStream environment, but your developers only work from nine to five. And so you don't want to spin up machines until they're ready to use them. So that's what I have here. This happens to be the time frame that we're in right now. It's Tuesday at 6, 11 p.m. And so this has already spun up one machine. And you can see that it's there and ready for a user to grab. So the provisioning limits will tell LeoStream when to provision machines. And then the provisioning parameters, here we, here's where you tell us how to create the machine. And as I mentioned, you do need to have your infrastructure as a code system that you're using, build the virtual networks and anything else, security groups you see in the case of AWS. And then you can leverage LeoStream to make sure the machines get created in the correct place. So here I'm creating a machine with a naming convention that matches my pool definition. I pick the image that I'm creating the machine from very important that the LeoStream agent is installed on that image so that it can interact with your connection broker and you can manage the user's session. And then obviously for cloud environments, tell us what size, network, security groups. And then there's this option to mark it as deletable. If you do want to use LeoStream to be scaling in as well as scaling out your environment, then you mark the machines that LeoStream creates as deletable. And that way, the connection broker knows it has permission to delete the machine when the user is done with it. So pools are really the key to the scaling out of your cloud or your virtualization environments. Release plans are really where you can scale it back in because essentially what is, will happen when you look at a user's session, they log into Leo stream, we authenticate them. We offer them the desktops that they're offered based on their policy. When the user clicks on a machine to connect to it, that machine then gets assigned to the user. And as long as the machine is assigned to the user, nobody else gets offered it. LeoStream will not delete it. And that user keeps getting that machine every time they log into LeoStream. You can use the release plans to indicate when should that assignment be released. And that release event can trigger the, the delete of the machine, which depending on how your pools are spun up or set up, might spin up a new virtual machine in the background for the next user. So this form, it's, it's very much broken into these sections that are based on the events that came that come from the LeoStream agent. This is why I mentioned the LeoStream agent is very important to have on your base images and all of your desktops, because it really is the key to getting the most power and flexibility out of the connection broker. So just as an example, if we 
read through how this release plan works. If the user disconnects, you know, I click the button on the display protocols window. So I'm still logged into the remote OS. It'll wait an hour, and after an hour goes by, if the user hasn't reconnected, the connection broker would instruct the LeoStream agent to forcefully log the user out. Mm -hmm. Now, these events can trigger one another, so that logout then triggers this part of the plan, which releases the machine to a pool, and the release event then triggers the when desktop is released section of the pool, which is where you could come in and potentially immediately delete the machine. So for machines that are being assigned to users, the release plan is going to control deleting that machine. If you use that scheduling functionality I, sh I showed you in the pools for provisioning, then it's the end of the schedule that would automatically delete any unused machines. So if there's any machines hanging out unassigned, the broker will realize, oh, you don't want these to be around anymore and just automatically terminate them for you. Just to show you quickly how the collaboration is set up in LeoStream, when the a user logs into LeoStream, they are assigned a policy, and it's inside the policy that they are offered the pools that they are allowed to connect to. And then in the pools, again, you see this form. The policy form is very much set up based on the events that are going on in the user's session. First, they log in. Then they get assigned to a machine. Then they connect to the machine. When they connect to the machine, you can indicate if it's a machine that they're allowed to collaborate with other users on. And you can actually then indicate if it's all users or if you have different groups of users who are allowed to work together, you can limit the user to only inviting other users in their group. You can even then allow the users to send emails to each other so that if someone's not logged into LeoStream, they'll get a little notification that the invitation is ready for them. The collaboration is based both on this policy option and on a role option here. So that is the key, is to make sure if you're using the collaboration functionality, you want to turn it back on both in the policy and in the role. So I mentioned the policies get assigned out to users based on the authentication servers. In my case, I'm going to show you logging in via Okta. So I can look at this. And essentially, I have set up the application in Okta to return an attribute called my groups in the SAML assertion that comes back. And so I'm assigning people who are in my demo group to a collaborator role. And in this case, this Linux DCV and developer environment desktop. Now this developer des environment desktop is interesting because what I'm actually gonna do when I connect to that one is do an SSH connection via the LeoStream gateway. So to do that, I had set up the protocol plan here so that when users log in from the web browser, connection goes through the gateway and it connects via SSH in browser. The Galileo Stream gateway is great with its built-in HTML5 viewer really for the clientless access. It gives you a way to not have to install software on users' devices. And also for Linux environments, having the ability to SSH is great for developers who just need to get to the command line anyway. So that Linux machine is actually tucked away in AWS as is the Linux DCV machine. So to show you what this looks like from an end user's perspective, if I hit that same URL here, now because I'm logging in as an end user, it's actually redirecting me over to Okta to do the login. You do have options to not automatically do the redirect, but for security's sake, if someone, if you've got Okta set up, chances are you want to redirect the user. So we default to that. I'm going to log in, and that's going to take me over here to my end user login. Now, we have seen people do some really neat things with this. They can embed this, uh, this interface into an iframe. So we've seen people wrap that into their own portals that they have, which is kind of neat. You can rebrand this however you need to do. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to there. Now, remember, LeoStream doesn't have a password because I logged in through Okta. So it's going to prompt me here to log into this SSH session. And now I'm peacefully SSH'd into my Ubuntu machine that happens to be running up in AWS in this case. If I close that out, we'll actually close the tab for you there. And then I have a connection here, which is a nice DCV connection. This one's a little different. In this case, it is actually downloading the DCV file to launch the connection. Now, again, I don't have a password to pass around because I came in through SAML, but I enter my password and now I get logged in here. So while all that's going on here, 
You know, monitoring is another big concept in, in a DevOps workflows. And in the case of LeoStream, what it allows you to monitor is the user session. What's going on as people are using all of your environment. And that is tracked really well here on the log page. So I can see when people log in, what they were offered, what they requested a connection to. You see the LeoStream agent notices come in here. And this gives you a real good way to kind of keep heartbeat on what's going on in your system. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. If you do have some questions about automating the creation of your LeoStream environment, or if you want to give it a try for managing access to these types of environments, you can feel free to give us an, drop us an email at sales at leostream.com. We have free trials, and we're willing to talk to you a little bit more about how to satisfy all of your use cases. Thanks.